morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the December 20th TAP meeting, ta uh, Transportation Planning and Environment meeting. Um, we have a busy agenda this morning as usual, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm gonna first start with introductions and we'll go, uh, I'll just start with those online. Julie Eisel, committee chair. Ed Driggs, committee member. Braxton Winston, committee member. How about in the room? Larkin Eggleston, committee vice chair. Okay, how about staff? Allison Craig, deputy planning director. Liz Babson, transportation director. Alicia Osborne, planning. Kathy Cornett, planning. But this is Matt Prosser with Economic and Planning Systems, virtually. Sierra Brighton, Communication and Marketing. Anybody else? Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, our first item on the agenda this morning is a policy the policy map for the 2040 plan implementation an update by Alicia Osborne and Matt Prozer. So I will turn it over to either Matt or Alicia, it looks like Matt, to get started. Um, if, if, if you don't mind, um, you know, pretend I'm gonna just kick this off really quickly. So do we oh, have the sorry, slides? Listen. Yep, if you go to the next slide. So um, this is an opportunity to come before you all and talk about um, the policy map in advance of the second draft coming out um, on January 18th. And so Alicia is gonna talk a little bit about what we've heard from the community and how we're making changes to the map that are both technical as well as community driven um, revisions to the map. And then Matt will be here to talk about um, some preliminary findings from the fiscal impact analysis. And I just wanted to mention too that he will also be talking about the economic impact analysis for the UDO as part of the UDO presentation. So. Um, there will be more information about that particular part of his work in the next presentation. So with that, I'll kick it over to Alicia. Thanks, Allison, and thank you, Mayor Pro Tem and Council um, Committee members for the opportunity to share more information about the draft 2040 policy map and the process. Next slide, please. Just a quick reminder of what the policy map is. It's a translation of the comprehensive plans um, place-based policy to specific geographies. It's one of the key items that we are um, embarking upon to implement the vision in the 2040 comprehensive plan that was adopted in June. What it does is not only provide the translation of those place-based policy, but it provides citywide direction on balancing opportunities within our community. Um, opportunities for growth, where they may or may not go, how it aligns with our um, the line that future growth with our infrastructure capacity and what we mean by infrastructure capacity is directed into those major areas where we have the opportunity to provide transportation options as well as making sure that we integrate these, these growth vision with our uh, stormwater and other um, infrastructure needs within our community. And what this map will also do is think a little bit differently about how we prioritize our needs in the community and be equitable in that growth and addressing those areas and parts of the community that have been overlooked for some time and really trying to think about um, providing equitable growth using the equitable growth framework. And also using a tool that is called place types that looks a little bit beyond looking at just what how you use the land, but what types of building character form, um, how you move around and, and make connections to those uses as well as how do you provide open space and parks um, within the community. Next slide, please. And so this process is a three-step process. We started over the summer earlier this year, and that first step was creating a reference map, simply just looking at what's on the ground and translating that to uh, the place type palette that was adopted within the comprehensive plan. That was a reference map we used and went out to the public to get people really educated about what a place type is, how it's different than what we've done before in terms of um, planning for our growth and development, and then just really having a conversation to make sure that people understand why this work is important and how they can be engaged moving forward. 
The second step looked at our adopted policies. Um, believe it or not, um, we do have a, quite a bit of um, adopted policy, and I think the community really has taken um, uh, the time to learn that we have a direction now, and the comp plan is giving us a different vision that looks at how to, to manage and plan for that growth in the future. So we looked at future land use, the zoning, and where we had gaps in that data, we used some market support to, to better understand how we can grow and where that growth might happen. That third step is where we created the um, Charlotte Future 2040 policy map. That is using the policies within the adopted plan that happened in June, and then really starting to take those place-based policies along with our equitable growth framework to make sure that we're balancing opportunity. And we had quite a bit of um, community engagement on that part, and that map was released in October. And we'll talk in your um, briefing books that you receive bi-weekly. We make sure that you guys are aware of what we're hearing from the community. We'll talk a little bit more about that today. The second part of the map, which Matt will, um, Matt Prosser will focus on, is um, how did the data in terms of growth projections and market feasibility and all of that um, help produce that first draft of the map? And then he'll talk a little bit about the next steps um, for the second draft. Next slide, please. Next slide. And so a little bit about the engagement. Um, the three-step process, our engagement mirrored that three-step process. That was intentional because we wanted to make sure that the community was involved at each step of the process and understood how the pieces went together. That first phase over the summer was really a, a survey to help us understand better did we get the patterns of development right and to inform how we created the map and methodology and approach. And then when we released the map in October, we kicked off with two introductory meetings that just really um, told the story about how this work fits together and what it means for um, each community. And we had a series of community conversations around 15 geographies, offered two sessions per day, make-up sessions on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday in some cases, and continue to do pop-up to make sure, pop-up events to make sure that people felt like they were being heard, had an opportunity to share, and then supplement all of that virtual work and some of that pop-up event work with um, in-person office hours. There were eight-hour days where people could just come in around the community and um, the, the government center, come in and talk to us with the staff person if they have a question. What was different about this engagement is that um, it wasn't so much as an education part, but people had specific things that they wanted to address. And so those conversations really were focused on specific concerns or questions or things that they wanted to see addressed in the next draft of the map. And so here's just a snapshot of what we were able to um, our reach in this phase of the process. Next slide, please. And so those community conversations, um, also we talked about the streets map, um, the pace, place type palette review, the methodology, um, and then asking what do we miss. I think oftentimes um, it's probably believed that engagement is just for us talking to people, but a lot of we wanted to listen because we know we don't always get it right. What kind of adjustments do we need to make in, those, uh, in, those, in our mapping methodology and our process moving forward? Next slide, please. We also had an online tool, that's the map that you see at the lower left-hand corner of the slide. That's where most people decided to participate and then they showed up at the community conversations with specific questions or clarification um, um, items around what they submitted on the comment app. And so we had over 960 comments that were recorded as part of this entire process. We got emails. Um, phone calls, all types of ways that people had to reach out to us. And we submitted, we published those comments. They are online on Charlotte, CLTFuture2040.com if you want to see what people were saying exactly. And then we'll also um, provide responses to all 960 comments later on today, um, responses to those comments. And I'll talk a little bit about what those responses may look like in the next couple of slides. Next slide, please. Next slide. 
So a lot of the conversations and feedback that we get, we receive from the community can be categorized into two big buckets. Um, there are some very technical revisions that we're making to the map that uh, really focuses on addressing inconsistencies. Um, some things weren't um, translated correctly. Um, just through conversations with staff about what they're hearing as part of the EEO process and their everyday work. And then some um, other things that are happening that uh, we know we needed to address in terms of the uh, methodology and mapping approach. And then there were some things that the community told us um, what their preferences were for certain areas and then just local knowledge of what's happening around them. That's why the community engagement was, was so important to this process because we were able to fill the gap between what we know technically and what the community knows um, every day and what should be reflected on the map from their um, everyday experiences. Next slide. So this slide summarizes some of the examples of the big mapping revisions. I won't walk through them all, but I'll highlight a few. Um, and I'm sure some of you have heard some of these from your constituents as well. Um, the first one is um, reducing the size of activity centers and provider better transitions to surrounding neighborhoods. We've heard that um, particularly from some neighborhoods where we have our major activity centers like Uptown or some transit station areas or um, folk areas like South Park. How do we address the transition from those intense areas down to the single family neighborhoods or just to a lesser intense um, place type? So we have um, made some adjustments to the map and approach to address that. The next one is pretty important as well. Um, looking at neighborhood one, ensuring preservation of the, our um, established neighborhoods in that particular place type. Um, we were trying to balance the, um, the need for accommodating future growth but, um, and also uh, the need to ensure preservation of those existing neighborhoods. So we went back to make some adjustments in the methodology to prioritize um, preservation of the existing uh, neighborhood one. Um, the third um, example of revision is um, there was a lot of questions about kind of sporadic location of manufacturing and logistics place type that's um, commonly known as our industrial land uses. So uh, what we had originally done was coded utilities, um, cell phone towers and those types of uses as manufacturing logistics. And what we've done is made an adjustment where those are um, particular uses um, assume the place type that is near them or where they're located. So we won't have that sporadic location of M&L throughout our neighborhoods. The other big one I wanted to point out um, is um, the current, current to, to improving the translation between our existing zoning districts and place types to improve accuracy in the map. I think Council Member Driggs mentioned last week in the council meeting that his neighborhood was neighborhood two. Um, that's because the zoning for it is R12 and it was coded as R12 uh, multifamily, which are two different districts. One is old and the other one is uh, fairly new and used more commonly. So we worked really closely with our partners in zoning um, to make sure we improve that crosswalk and to better understand what's actual on the ground and what's the future of those areas to make sure we get it right and establish in the place type. And then the last one, we had lots of questions about um, how will rezonings, recent rezonings be recognized within the place types. Um, so at the time of the production of the map, we had used um, a kind of a cutoff date for the rezonings that were a part of the place type. Um, and then when the map is adopted, hopefully in February, it will reflect any rezoning that has happened within that time period but prior to adoption. So we wanted to make sure that we keep that zoning layer updated and will reflect on the, the proposed uh, or adopted uh, place type map in the future, if that makes sense. Next slide. So now I'll turn it over to Matt Prosser um, to talk about the economic piece of the place type map. Madam Chair, I have some questions about what we just heard. Can I ask them before we move on to the next piece? Yeah, I think that makes sense. I do as well. Go ahead, Mr. Driggs. Thank you. Um, I've said before that I, I have a concern that the kind of outreach we're doing 
doesn't actually penetrate very well. And I know from my weekly meetings and from some HOA meetings I've had, the level of understanding or knowledge about all of this that the general public has is very low. <clears throat> People were asking me, does uh, 2.1 mean that uh, my house could be condemned and torn down in order to make way for apartment buildings? And there's that level of kind of uncertainty or misinformation out there. Um, so uh, I'm concerned that the feedback we're getting is not necessarily representative of the reaction that is likely when everybody finds out what all of this actually means. Is it not possible to actually mail everybody, just send out a huge mailing and say, this is what you were and this is what you will be, uh, and, and see what kind of reaction we get to that? That's, that's something we can explore. Um, I know initially in the process we sent out um, a mailer to every uh, property owner within the city and this ETJ it was about close to 400,000 um, postcards. Um, we just have to see one, the cost, two, and how that fits into the process to make sure the mailer arrives to people at a certain time in the process where they feel like they can have input into the um, to the production of this, the next draft of the map. Uh, I just think uh, whatever that cost is in relation to the magnitude of these issues and the headaches that we could save ourselves, we don't want to get too far down the road and then have people wake up and go, what? Uh, and, and the issue you mentioned about my neighborhood, um, what was odd here was one side of my street seemed to have been zoned N2 and the other side was, a, was an N1 place map. Mm -hmm. And if you go through this neighborhood, it's really not apparent why there should be any difference uh, between the two sides of the street. <clears throat> so I guess you were just well. saying it was an R12, which I find odd, which is okay. Uh, but that kind of thing. Um, the, uh, the other thing is we have the 960 um, the one thing we don't want to do, which was a frequent comment during the 2040 plan, is simply treat those as questions that need to be answered or issues that need that are informational and don't cause us to reconsider what we're doing. And I know Ms. Harmon, in a similar presentation to this one, noted that there were places where actual changes were indicated. So uh, I'd like to be confident that we are very open to uh, making changes that might be indicated by some of the feedback we get so that it doesn't just come down to explaining to people why it's being done this way as opposed to considering doing it differently. Um, that's really just more of a comment. I'm interested that uh, in those issues you mentioned, it doesn't look as if anybody has come back with any concerns about 2.1 or the fact that they are now subject to uh, uh, more intense development in single family neighborhoods. Have we really not heard from anybody about that? Because I've gotten a lot of emails. We have not, Mr. Driggs. That has, um, there's been more questions about um, does place types impact their zoning or develop or, or ability to develop in the future, what that looks like. Um, but not very much mention of two point policy 2.1. Um, the comments are available online. Um, and anyone can review them at their leisure, but we have not received a lot of uh, comments about that as part of this process. I think maybe that's not a place type thing, but uh, do we know how many people have actually visited the website and looked at the map? Um, I don't have that number in front of me. I can make sure you get it um, as soon as uh, we're finished here. All right, I, so I, I just want to generally emphasize that uh, the more we can do now to ensure that people are aware and know what it means for them, because mm -hmm. you'll get a postcard or something and it looks like a standard form, nothing personal, et cetera, and people just don't read it. You know, I know most of my campaign material ends up in the trash, so uh, they don't. Uh, I just want to make sure that our outreach uh, is as comprehensive as possible now, instead of finding out later that people are upset about some provisions of this, because otherwise we'll spend a lot of time fixing this later on. Right. Thank you. Well, what I will say, Mr. Driggs, what we're planning to do with the revised map Thank you. is to show the difference between the map today and the future map. 
Um, a lot of the comments are hard to respond to because they're spatial. Um, they're actually on a map. So you have to show people and illustrate what that looks like. But our revised map will, will make that easy for people to understand. But thank you for your comments. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I have comments about that as well. And I apologize if I'm turning off my video. It's because my signal isn't very strong. And it, um, the video helps from, keeps it from being real clear. But I, I wonder, uh, Alicia, if some of the comments that Mr. Driggs is talking about regarding 2.1 it, it has been put in the context of that transition between intense development and single family neighborhood. Because I'm hearing that a lot, and I know you all have, um, regarding the TOD specifically, but it's the same idea that you go from allowing this incredible density in the TOD, which is where it should be, but there's this spillover effect into single family neighborhoods. So I'm, I'm curious to know what was changed. You had said that, you know, you had, I think you said that you've made some tweaks with regards to transitioning between development and single family neighborhoods. So I too would like to know specifically what has been changed in the document or on the mapping um, because of the comments that came in, single family neighborhoods. And if you can go back to the slide with the six different categories. Thank you. Um, oh, two other things. Preserving, ensuring preservation of existing parks or preserves. I, <clears throat> the conversation has been coming up a lot with county commissioners regarding future parks and preserves. And the, to me, the, the map is a great opportunity to show where we're missing park space and open space. And so I'm, I'm wondering what role the map has in identifying where we need to have future park space. And, that, and by we, I mean the other bodies of local government, i.e. the county commission. Um, what, where does all of that discussion take place? So um, since the beginning of the comprehensive plan, um, way back 2018, we've worked closely with um, Mecklenburg Park and Recreation in development of their MEC playbook, which is their Parks and Recreation Master Plan. And so they have been partners in developing where their future sites are, and that will be reflected in the, um, reflected in the Parks and Preserve Place Type Map. And so we have been working with them um, if they made any changes or adjustment because the MEC playbook isn't adopted, we just need to circle back to make sure we're not missing anything. But we have been working with them since the beginning on where their parks are today, making sure we understand how those should be coded on the map, as well as where they plan to have future parks and um, greenways. So this map will reflect their plans. Madam Chair, could I ask a follow-up to that question? Sure, and, and, and I just want to follow up with this as well. I, I'm, I'm a little confused by that because um, I've seen the playbook, but it's thick. And for us to read it all, I think, isn't really practical. I, I wish there was some sort of an executive summary that we could be given so we understand their planning process and where we do expect future parks to be, where they, they're holding land or whatever, so that it doesn't continually come up as a one-off in individual rezonings. And Ed, go ahead if you have a, want to add uh, that. Yeah, so Alicia, when you talk to the county, uh, are you getting the impression at all that they expect us to kind of create opportunities for parks, like to, to cause land to be dedicated in, in the context of our rezoning process? Because we had this demand recently in conjunction with that very large rezoning in the Northeast. Um, and a commissioner came to our meeting, and, and uh, they, they were looking for a sort of set aside. They were looking for us to require that land be made available for parks. And on an earlier occasion, we had CMS come to us at Valentine Reimagined uh, and, and to the petitioner and say that they ought to set aside 30 acres for schools. Uh, my, my feeling is that CMS and the county need to buy land for schools and for parks. 
But do you think from your conversations with them that they understand that? What I will say is that that tool, as you described, is, uh, has been a big way for them to implement their vision um, and where they want to see future parks and also schools as well. I'm not sure if that strategy is changing. Um, I haven't seen anything that says otherwise. But what I do know is that the policy map will recognize where they would like to have future parks and greenways, but how they implement that vision, I, I cannot say that I'm 100% sure. Well, I, I would just say to you on this very specific issue, do they understand that they need to buy that land and can't expect us to create that land for them through our land use decisions? Uh, if we can sort of take any opportunity to reinforce that message and not give them the sense that our conversations with them uh, mean that we are open to the idea uh, we, we can require open space, but that open space in a rezoning is private property and is subject to uh, the liabilities and the management of the owner. And a park is a different animal. That's, a, that's county property. They're liable. They maintain it. They can put their greenways, whatever they want to do in there. But I don't want that distinction between stuff that they buy and control and stuff that we may create as open space to kind of get blurred or for them to start pushing on us for open space thinking that that meets their park objectives. Okay, we can follow up on that issue. Thank you, Mr. Jake. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have other questions. Any other committee members? Do you have anything? If not, we'll go on to the next item, which is the UDO. And uh, again, we have Alice. That was just. Craig and, oh. We still have more of this presentation. Oh gosh, I'm really sorry. I thought we did get through that really fast. I'm sorry, Alicia. <laughs> okay, go ahead, guys. Great. So um, this is Matt Prosser with Economic and Planning Systems. I'll be uh, taking over the rest of this portion of the presentation. Um, to give you an update on the number, the numerous uh, economic studies that are being completed to support the policy mapping efforts. Um, so we'll be talking about the fiscal impact analysis, um, revisiting the duplex and triplex likelihood analysis that we've uh, presented to you all previously, um, and then discussing next steps. So just a reminder, um, there's a, a number of terms uh, that are thrown around and just to try to provide some clarity on the different analyses that we're doing. Um, we are doing a fiscal impact analysis, which is a tool to look at estimating the impact of uh, the land use plan on specifically the city's uh, general fund. Um, and that can be done either citywide, but also on a project by project basis. We're also doing so there's still a level of economic analysis, impact analysis, that more looks at the impacts on change on the larger economy. Um, and then as well as doing some market demand and, mar and development feasibility analysis uh, to support. So a, a, a wide range of different economic analyses um, that will be, will be and have been completed. Uh, next slide. So just to give you an update on where we are um, within the comprehensive plan process, we had completed a, a growth factors report as well as developed a fiscal impact model that we're now utilizing within the policy mapping process. Uh, process. Um, and so we've done some, I'll touch on this in a second, um, some market readiness analysis. Um, we have draft findings related to fiscal impact analysis. And also, like I mentioned that duplex and triplex likelihood analysis. Um, so next slide. So first looking at the policy map. Next slide. Um, so like I mentioned, we did, uh, we're doing two kind of major analysis to support the policy map. First is using a, a market analysis and a land suitability analysis to help inform where land use designations or place type designations are made. And then also using the fiscal impact analysis to both evaluate and inform uh, the policy map as we go through the different iterations. Uh, next slide. Um, so within the market, uh, market readiness and land suitability analysis, 
these are tools that we use to help understand where we think there is market demand for change, um, both from uh, the aspects of the current uh, assets in an area and then also uh, recent market trends, giving us an indication of uh, where trends are pushing uh, developments in the city and how can we make sure that we're being cognizant of those trends and trying to reflect those um, in consideration with uh, the other uh, major um, plan policies. We also did a, a land suitability analysis, which uh, looks at the attributes of, of the entire city in different areas to identify if they have the right attributes that are suitable for say office development or industrial development or for higher density residential. Um, and so a variety of different attributes are, are assigned to these different uh, uses to make sure that we are putting uses or place types in areas that are suitable for them um, from a market perspective. And we've done this within step two of creating the policy map and then are continuing to use this analysis to further refine as needed. Uh, next slide is an example of that. So as you may are probably aware, the Economic Development Department had commissioned a, a large study looking at um, the, the demand and need for industrial lands and industrial jobs within uh, the city and the county. And so what we've done is taken the findings from that study and try to translate those into potential changes that may be needed in the policy map. And that has been oh, stay, reflected in three different ways. Um, first, we've identified areas where it may make sense to shift the manufacturing and logistics place type designation to the industrial mixed use um, designation. These are more sort of uh, inner city areas where we have outmoded um, and older industrial buildings that are, are not attractive to modern users. And so there's potential for re-adaptive reuse and change in those buildings. We also found more opportunity in different areas to preserve manufacturing and logistic lands um, in accordance with the guidance that's provided in that report. Um, and then also did some work with CDOT, CATS, and um, the Economic Development Department to start to identify ways we can um, address conflicts between the designation of industrial uses in areas that uh, are planned for trans transit improvements uh, and for TOD. And how do we uh, create a, a more adaptable and uh, better suited approach in those areas specifically? It's really uh, the silver line to the West where we really made a lot of, put a lot of focus into um, ways that we can make sure we're preserving uh, existing and future opportunity for industrial jobs, but also taking advantage of transit and pushing higher density uses to those transit stations. Uh, next slide. Um, so in addition to the market analysis, we've been doing a fiscal impact analysis um, that we've presented to you all before on, in various um, settings. Um, and part of that fiscal impact analysis are a couple different components. The first one is a growth areas assessment questionnaire. And this is a um, tool that we're using to inform changes to the map. It's really reflecting the forecasted change in jobs and households and throughout the city um, in a way that a graphic and data ways that the different departments in the city and county can use to uh, start to identify major capital improvements or challenges we might have to accommodating growth based on the policy map. Um, we're also doing, uh, using the fiscal impact model to evaluate ongoing impacts on the city and the county's general fund and also doing some revenue forecasts as needed to support um, planning efforts. Next slide. Um, so I mentioned that growth map questionnaire. So we've provided um, maps to show where the potential density of jobs and households are likely to occur and some supporting data by different geographies that um, different departments like fire or Charlotte water use to do planning um, for growth. Um, and we have sent those out and we'll be gathering feedback from them um, over the next month to inform the next draft of the, the policy map to make sure that we're uh, not identifying uh, areas for um, significant growth that can't support it. Um, or vice versa, are there areas where they're planning for growth where the, the policy map is not necessarily reflecting that? And so we'll be updating you all on the findings from that uh, questionnaire uh, the next time that we present to you likely. Next slide. 
and then as I mentioned, we have the fiscal impact model um, that takes new jobs and households that are forecasted and estimates the impacts on the general fund, both looking at revenues and expenditures and getting at a net fiscal impact number on an ongoing basis for the city. Next slide shows the two departments where we found very significant uh, potential impacts of different place type designations. And so CDOT and FIRE are the two departments that are most directly impacted by the pattern and location of growth. Uh, specifically um, related to CDOT, um, there are areas that generate more uh, demand for new lane miles to maintain have, have the greatest impact. And traditionally, in infill locations that there's a lesser impact. Um, and when we look at different place types that are more impactful, our neighborhood ones and neighborhood two uh, areas are the ones that generally produce more lane miles per capita um, and, and can be more costly to maintain. And so we need to balance that with opportunities for mixed use and employment uses is, is the takeaway there. And then from a fire perspective, it, there's a great diversity of impact depending on different place types that are, are impacted by the transportation network, the density of developments, and other considerations. And so we've uh, factored in the challenges that they have throughout the city to identify potential issues. Uh, next slide. And so to do all this analysis, we use this community viz model that you may be familiar with. And this model is used to um, translate countywide growth forecasts um, into area specific uh, estimations of where development is likely to occur. Um, and so what it does is it allocates forecasted jobs and households by um, different use types, whether that's retail or office or single family or multifamily uh, throughout the city based on the place type designation and then also the underlying probability that a, a parcel may develop. Um, and we use that, the outputs from that model to do our fiscal impact modeling and other um, analyses that are needed to support the policy map. Next slide. Um, and so generally what we're finding when we start to look at our adopted policy map versus our 2040 map. So where we are now headed to where uh, the current draft of policy map is, is taking us is that there's a greater shift to more uh, mixed use places, more activity center place types, um, and less of sort of the single use place type designations. And it doesn't mean that the whole city is becoming necessarily all mixed use. Um, we still predominantly, the, the city is made up of, of residential only um, place types, whether that's neighborhood or one, neighborhood one or neighborhood two. Um, but there is a greater opportunity and shift towards those mixed use places. And that, uh, in the next slide, um, translates into uh, a, a development pattern in our estimation that is, is more efficient. Um, it's Our estimation is that the, the 2040 map creates about a 2% annual reduction in the cost to serve um, the new development that's forecast. That's not a substantial change, but it is, it is a benefit and that the pattern that we're projecting in the policy map is more beneficial than the growth pattern that we currently have today. Um, next slide. Um, next, I will walk through um, the duplex triplex likelihood analysis just to give you an update on where we are with that and any final questions before we finalize that analysis. Um, next slide. As you recall, we evaluated, uh, did this analysis to really understand what the uh, geographic impact might be of the 2.1 policy that allows for duplexes and triplexes within single family neighborhoods. Um, and we looked, did this evaluation considering both the physical capacity of parcels to support a uh, duplex and also where we think market support is greatest. And we found that the market feasibility and support of this type of change is the most impactful and that the zoning categories that are within the draft UDO are, are designed in a way to accommodate this change. And so the market, um, uh, feasibility is really the major driving factor. Next slide. Um, and so our original approach uh, that was <clears throat> looking at one of sort of one model of duplex um, identified areas that were more or less likely for change. Um, and we found a 6% of single family lots had the highest likeliness uh, for change. Um, next slide. 
So based on feedback that we received from you all, which was very constructive and, and I think very helpful in, in making this a more robust analysis, we actually developed uh, pro formas or sort of simple model pro formas for six different duplex types, um, ranging in price from $250,000 per unit all the way up to a million dollars per unit. And that fits well within the range of sales that we actually found within the community. And then did this similar type of valuation to, to identify where throughout the community we thought each one of these model types may be feasible based on existing land uh, prices and values and also existing sales prices for duplexes in those communities. Um, next slide. And that results in the map on the right. So on the map on the left, excuse me, <clears throat> is uh, the output from our original analysis. And then we did this uh, alternative approach to identify um, areas based on those six different pro forma models. And what we found is on, on the, at the high level, the percent of lots that were most likely was relatively the same. Um, but we did see shifts in where potential likeliness would occur. And what we found is there, uh, there is a greater likeliness uh, for some of those lower priced um, duplex products than we had modeled previously. Our, our previous model was sort of a, a four fifty to five hundred thousand uh, dollar duplex model, and what we found, if you look at the next slide, um, is that uh, there's a greater presence of potential or likeliness, I should say, for some of these lower value. Uh, duplex models and specifically in some of those uh, areas that are in our vulnerable dis or displacement area. Um, and so um, there are opportunity or we think likeliness for duplexes that range in sort of that 250 to 500 range for those to actually be feasible developments in some of those neighborhoods to the, the east or west of uptown. Um, and so a greater presence in those neighborhoods. Uh, we will note, though, those price points of, you know, under $400,000 is actually well within the target sort of AMI level that you are going for in terms of affordable home ownership options in the community. And so while it does create the opportunity for change in those neighborhoods and that can be impactful, it, it, it may also lead to the presence of more homes that may be affordable to folks throughout the city. Um, we also continue to find that there is opportunity and likeliness for uh, conversion of, of home or single family lots in South Charlotte to, to more higher price models, uh, especially those models above 500,000 um, in some of those Southern neighborhoods. And so just wanted to reflect back to you all that we did take your, uh, your feedback into account and, and did a, a fairly uh, robust alternative approach to try to evaluate changes and I think uh, as previously mentioned by a number of you, um, this map and this analysis is an opportunity to use uh, use the data as a way to start to identify neighborhoods that we may need to um, be proactive in applying different uh, measures or policies around anti-displacement or curbing the impacts of, of potential change in those neighborhoods um, as a way to um, to gauge and measure and potentially mitigate any unintended consequences from this policy. So uh, that was a lot of presenting of data and analysis and I'm happy to go back to any of it and have a discussion as needed. So um, with that, uh, I'll leave it to you all for any questions. Thanks, Matt. I see uh, Matt Newton has a question and then Mr. Driggs um, has a question. So, Mr. Newton, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks for that uh, presentation, Matt. My question uh, revolves around, this is a question I've asked before, uh, so I, I don't know if I missed it in your presentation just now, but it revolves around areas where there is no development. So, it seems like this assessment uh, has been confined to uh, areas where there is pre-existing single-family uh, development uh, but but I'm, I'm still not hearing any analysis on areas that that aren't developed at all. Uh, and I know that there are, are places within our city where there is new subdivision growth going in, new development altogether. And I just wanted to ask, do we have any information? Have you looked into the impacts of the potential for 
new subdivisions that have duplexes and triplexes within them uh, going into into areas just all together, just new, just new stuff, rather than existing neighborhoods being impacted. How will this new stuff be impactful? Does that does that make yeah. sense? Good development. Yeah, that's um, so. A couple of thoughts to that. Um, so the community the community viz model does produce uh, forecasts for um, new households by type, and so there's three types within that model: a single family detached, an attached, and multifamily. Um, and so what we can do is go dig into that data and identify, um, provide graphic representation of where new um, um, new single family or attached or multifamily units are forecast. Um, and so we can provide that data based on that model. That model primarily looks at identifying properties that are vacant or underutilized as the locations for potential growth. And so that tool is the best to sort of assess uh, what we think the potential changes may be um, in, by different locations throughout the city. Um, there is some limits to that in terms of, um, of the allocation of different housing types that are sort of the control totals. So I'll have to, to further look into that as well, but we can, bring some data back to you to give you sort of a geographic look at where at least the community viz model thinks those types of housing units are likely to go based on the policy map. And when you say vacant or under underutilized, are you talking about single lots or are you talking about also the inclusion of, you know, full-fledged acreage that yeah. has to be developed altogether? Yeah, the second one. So the community viz model, uh, every parcel in the county is assessed for its development context, whether it's vacant, underutilized, developed, or um, or you know constrained from you know if it's a park or a floodplain, those sorts of things as well. And so, large acreage of new development lands for you know uh, single-family neighborhoods would be included in that and should be captured. Great, thank you, Matt. I really appreciate. It. I look forward to that information. Are there, I, I would ask uh, Mr. Newton, is there any specific questions or concerns you, you'd like us to dig into that or more just wanting to understand where the potential is? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, the I'm gonna sound like a broken record on this and I know all my colleagues have heard it uh, uh, before, but uh, the Far East in particular is an area where we're looking at upwards of about 15 to, to 20 new developments yet to, to go in uh, and we, don't fully uh, understand or I think ha have gauged the, the impact on uh, traffic and infrastructure in the area uh, or, or on our goals for 10 minute neighborhoods. Uh, granted, that's all been approved. It will be proceeding forward, but I think it speaks to kind of the greater uh, concern of that, that, that boom of growth in the area that will continue. I've had conversations with developers who are, are looking at ways in which they can further increase unit counts in future developments in the area, particularly through duplexes and triplexes. I would assume, and I believe that that's not just uh, uh, isolated to the Far East, by the way, but that's uh, my frame of reference. And so when I say Far East, east of uh, Harris Boulevard out to the 485 corridor, particularly up Harrisburg Road, um, Robinson Church and Plaza Road Extension. So if you can look into that map, I would be very appreciative. Yeah, and part of that growth map questionnaire that we mentioned as well is an opportunity for us to have a discussion with CDOT about um, transportation capacity related to the forecasted growth um, as well. And so we'll, we'll try to bring back what we can related to that conversation. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Driggs. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Matt, as you know, I love data and I appreciate what you're doing here. I'm still trying to process everything you've told us, but uh, on the policy map, when you do the kind of analysis you're talking about, industrial here and so on there, um, are, are the changes that are implied by that analysis substantial? Uh, and if so, 
are we going to have a council policy conversation on questions like how much industrial do we land do we need and where should it be? Um, so it's one of many inputs that went into the map and sort of the analysis uh, framework or the I said the methodology. Um, it, most specifically, where we used the market readiness analysis was where we had areas that had the potential for one or I'm sorry, two or three different place types based on either underlining zoning or plans uh, or existing plans or the other factors that went in. And we used it as a way to sort of gauge uh, or to resolve some of those conflicts, if you will. And so we had a number of those, I think about 12, 12 or so, 15, where we, it was, it was, it could have gone one way or the other. Um, and so what we did was we used that market readiness analysis to either make sure that we thought there was market support for it or that it had the underlying um, attributes that are supported. So if it was an industrial use, is it have access to transportation? Is there a rail line? Um, those sort of considerations uh, for the types of lands that an uh, industrial developer or an office developer would need for that to be a successful product. And it was, so it was more sort of a, a way to, for us to uh, interject market uh, realities and sort of land use economics into the policy mapping methodology in a way to resolve some of those conflicts. Right, I get that uh, and I appreciate it because that was not obvious to me early on. So we are now getting down to sort of joining up with reality in terms of what we're doing. But what it does mean is you have a variety of criteria that will ultimately determine what place type goes where and uh, I guess I'll just watch as the map evolves and, and see whether there's stuff going on that we, we may want to think about, you know, in terms of where it turns out that we're, we've identified industrial uses. And in the context of council's priorities, whether those are actually the best places. And I know Mr. Winston has spoken in the past about the issue of uh, where those should be. And I'll let him talk if he wants to again. But so, so that's one thing. Uh, the, uh, when you say displacement, uh, vulnerable to displacement, uh, are you taking into account the HOA agreements and deed restrictions? That was an issue I had raised before uh, that I thought might steer a lot of the higher density development into the vulnerable neighborhoods. Yeah, we have factored that in. Um, um, uh, what it does is if for some of the areas that we think may be likely, uh, it re reduces the likelihood um, that would of that potential. And so what we can do is try to overlay that analysis on the alternative approach and see if there's a, a significant decrease in certain areas that were identified as highly likely. Um, my my first blush or high level blush is that I don't think um, there are sub substantial changes, but I think that's something we can evaluate and come back to you as sort of a last piece to this analysis. Um, we did do that with the first in one. In how the anti-displacement commission that we created will effectively impact what we're doing here and what, what actual steps we can take. Because you've got that issue out there, right? As it stands right now, uh, those, those locations are available for purchase by developers and we don't have anything legal or binding to prevent them from putting these higher cost units in. So I appreciate that you're looking at that, but I, I still think there's a step remaining in order for us to kind of, in the context of our identified shortage of affordable housing of 20,000 to 30,000 units, you know, how does that number kind of evolve as a result of all of this? Uh, and it's, it, it may be that there's one more step than uh, in the context of everything you've told us that would get us to a simple conclusion about uh, affordable housing and what will happen to it or what we need to do on the Anti-Displacement Commission. Uh, I don't know if this is a question for you, Matt, but uh, there there are court cases pending that would cause a lot of the protections from HOA agreements basically to lapse and neighborhoods need to take steps to preserve them. Um, is that anywhere in your calculation? Uh, are you following that at all? No, um, we can we can think about that, but I, I'm not sure exactly how that would fit in. Well, I'd like, Madam Chair, I'd like to talk to uh, Tari about this at some point. Uh, because this is potentially a big deal. The courts are saying that these HOA agreements 
can essentially expire, I think, after 30 years. And many neighborhoods that may be assuming now that they are protected need to look and see uh, when, when they might expire. And it is possible uh, currently to take steps to preserve, in effect, that status, like renew. But that is something, an action that neighborhoods will have to take if they want to get the benefit of the HOA uh, agreement protection. Um, and, and finally, Matt, just a brief comment. The fiscal impact study that we saw previously about the 2040 plan was frankly incredibly superficial and not very helpful. I mean, to tell us that we would have a 40% greater surplus 20 years from now if we went to the 2040 plan than uh, business as usual, when the difference was between $7 million and $11 million on a billion dollar budget, uh, and the methods they used were incredibly simplistic. So. If we're going to do a fiscal impact analysis, I, I hope it will do. Uh, it will go a little deeper than that. I'll just put it that way. Well, I'm, I, I invite you to. Uh, I'm open to having a conversation about how we may need to go more in depth. Um, I, I feel like we did a pretty robust analysis and uh, the comp plan, and are now using this this model for this policy mapping step uh, currently. And I think this is really the most impactful locate, place to use it. Um, and so there is, a, you know, a, a large, not a large, there's a delta between uh, the status quo map and, the, and the, the proposed 2040 map, which shows that we're more efficient. But to your point, uh, on the overall scale of the overall budget, it is a relatively small amount. Um, and so I think perhaps we're just making sure we're conveying that impact um, at the proper scale uh, and, and not trying to oversell or undersell um, the findings from it. And, and, you know, overall, I think fiscal impact is not our main driver, right? Uh, as long as there isn't some disastrous fiscal impact, yep. um, if, if we have minor, uh, the, the economic impact is much more important. You know, the, the, the way in which it changes the operation of our economy versus incremental changes in the city's budget uh, to yep. meet a much higher priority. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Matt. Yep. Thanks, Mr. Driggs. Uh, any other questions from the committee? Larkin, uh, Mr. Eggleston, if you want to, because uh, I can't see your hand raised. Do you have anything? I'm good on this piece. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, then I think that's it for that presentation. Is that right, Matt? Yep. Oh, actually, I have one more slide. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. There's a next step slide, just so you all know. Um, so. This is both next steps for the, the fiscal impact analysis, but also for the policy map or, uh, as, as well. And so I'll give an overview, and if Alicia has any comments or clarifications, I'll let her provide those. But um, in December, we've published responses to the comments that we've got from the map, and we are diving, or I shouldn't say diving, we have already <laughs> jumped into the technical work that's needed to start to produce a second draft uh, based on the, uh, the comments that we're getting and feedback. Um, and we've also, to a uh, previous comment from mine, we've provided that growth questionnaire to um, debar departments to start to identify any of those major capital issues that may exist. In January, um, there'll be another engagement window, engagement window number three, that'll kick off. We'll release a second draft of the policy map and do a number of listening sessions with staff, uh, with you all. Um, to evaluate any concerns or changes that may be needed. Um, in terms of the fiscal impact analysis, we'll be integrating findings from that growth map questionnaire from the different departments and providing a, a revised uh, analysis of the fiscal impact. Um, and then into February, uh, community conversations. Uh, we'll have a city council public comment session and then start to review uh, and begin the adoption process. And we'll be finalizing our analysis of the fiscal impact analysis and the economic uh, analyses that are supporting the policy map in February as well. Uh, Alicia, anything to add? No, that's it, Ned. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem, I do have a question on this slide. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Eggleston. So walk me through again if I'm Joe or Jane citizen and I have put one of the 960 plus comments on this first draft of the map um, it will they it, will it be incumbent upon them to go back to the site where they did that to check in and see what the response was will they 
get a response pushed to them specifically about their question. And as map two comes out, um, I feel confident, but would like it to be restated or would like to be reassured that someone who goes on and looks at the map again will it will be very clearly called out what has changed from from 1.0 to 2.0. Um, but how if I've submitted a comment or if I've been made aware by a neighbor that you know our block we think was sort of coded incorrectly, how will I find out that that has been changed? So a couple of different things. Um, today we will be publishing specifically um, responses to the comments that we have received to date throughout the process. Those will be available online. People will know about um, those comments and our responses the same way they've always been informed an email blast to everyone that's participated or our Charlotte Future 2040 blast email list, social media, and all of the uh, other channels that we'll use to make sure people know that their responses are available, um, or staff responses to their comments are available online. What will happen with the second draft of the map that comes out in um, mid-January is that um, Thanks, Mr. Driggs, for that suggestion, sending out another postcard um, to everyone so they will know specifically, here's the process, here's what, um, um, there's a, a revised draft of the map, and the way we're designing what that new map looks like, it'll be very clear to understand what happened in the first version to the new version, it'll be very, very clear. And then we can, we've also been um, kind of kicking around the idea, um, you can currently, enter in your address and find out what your place type is today. And so what we'll just add is what it is um, from the first draft and also what it is for the second draft. So it'll be pretty clear when you enter your address, you can see the difference between the first draft and the second draft for your particular parcel. So that's how we're going to make sure folks know what changed from one draft to the other. Thank you. Yeah, I think we'll have a, well, I'll, I'll say, I feel like I'll have a better sense of if we're on track and, and sort of on schedule with this piece, the, the policy map piece, once that second draft comes out and people have a chance to, to digest it because many of the things that have been brought to my attention, I know several other council members' attention, as we've addressed them with staff, there's been an acknowledgement that, oh yeah, we've already flagged that. We know that that was all for, we're already gonna adjust that. And so I think my hope is that, that the second version will calm a lot of the anxieties that maybe some of those things that were either just a mistake in the way that we, in inputs that we put in or in the outputs that a, whatever systems spit out or um, it sounded like a lot of that was, was going to be corrected. So I think the community will <coughs> find a lot of comfort in seeing that corrected in the second draft and, and hopefully there won't be as much feedback that they still see things that they think are, are amiss. So. I'll, I'll look forward to, and I think a lot of people will look forward to that second draft coming out and being able to um, see where we stand at that point. All right, and we'll also supplement that, just releasing the map with another round of listening sessions. So it won't just be, here's the map, tell us online what you think about it. If you have a specific question or concern, or just to say, yeah, you got it right, we'll have listening sessions and community conversations so we can have those one-on-one -on -one conversations or group conversations with folks about it too. Thank you. Okay, if there's no further questions, then we'll go ahead and move along. I had a question. Pardon? Oh, Mr. Phipps. Did y'all oh. see my hand raised? No, I don't. Oh, okay. But my connection isn't great, so please go ahead. Yeah. Appreciate the opportunity to speak, even though I'm not on the committee. Uh, I had a question in regards to the recently completed uh, logistics uh, um, locational study that was done. My question is, did we find any inconsistencies or contradictions with those uh, locations recommended through that study with our draft place mapping process currently underway? Yeah, so um, trying to think. So the, we evaluated that report um, and then went through a process to try to identify, identify potential changes we might make to the policy map. 
Um, and those occurred in three different ways. First, um, there was the reflection that there were some industrial buildings and areas in sort of the center part of the city that where those buildings are older, they don't necessarily have the ceiling heights or the number of docks or the column spacing or different building attributes that would be attractive to sort of modern, or I shouldn't say modern, but newer industrial businesses or users. And so there was the reflection that potentially some of those more inner, inner city uh, M and L locations could potentially be designated as IMU, uh, industrial mixed use, um, as a way to allow for a greater diversity of uses in those districts, but also support uh, more adaptive reuse of those industrial buildings. Uh, so that was one. The second one is we um, used the different areas that were identified, sub areas that were identified in that report to try to identify areas that may uh, be a, an opportunity for preservation of MNL. Um, and so those are either designated as an activity center or as IMU or some other place type, but the jobs reports identified them as, as viable locations. We, we went around and tried to identify the places that we thought one could be converted um, based on existing uses or based on potential. Um, and then the third one was there is some sort of inherent conflict in areas where transit lines are going and where existing um, industrial uses are or could be, um, specifically, as I mentioned on the Silver Line, uh, the proposed Silver Line alignment to the west uh, near the airports and out towards the edge of the county. Um, and so what we did is we had a conversation uh, with different departments to try to identify a more nuanced approach to how we may be able to allow for denser uses around the transit stations, but uh, preserve m &L opportunities in areas that were say uh, a quarter mile or a half mile away from that station. Um, and so the, there are map revisions that were made to better reflect that more nuanced approach and making sure that we're aligning with the, uh, the plans that CATS have, has been doing around those stations, but also reflecting the opportunities identified in that uh, industrial job study. Okay, great. So in areas that are designated as a ETJ, and to the extent that you have those logistical locations earmarked for those areas, to the extent that they may be voluntarily annexed within the city limits, would those locations still be applicable once they came into the city limits? Uh, to my knowledge, I, I believe so, but um, there may be others that know more about that transition than I do. You're Thank right, you. Matt. Okay, any other questions? All right, with that, we then move on to the UDO update from Allison and Laura, Laura Harmon, Allison Craig. And um, just a time check, I, I think we're just about right on target. I do have a hard stop um, at 1.30. Uh, and this, we've got 45 minutes allocated for this, so we should be okay. I don't know how much time we need though for the uh, last item, which is the 2022 meeting schedule. Probably not much. Do you want to go ahead, Madam Chair, and adopt that since that requires action while before anybody possibly has to jump off? Sure. Do you want to do that? Um, to adopt. We haven't seen it. That's no. okay. All right. Um, second. Okay. First and second. Uh, we've got it. We've got it here in the room, and, and I think the main thing to note is that it would move the meeting to the second Monday of each month, 1030 to 1230. Yes. And the yes. second Monday of the month would allow staff more time between the committee meeting and when we have our strategy session so that we can have a more thorough report out from the committee at those strategy sessions. Great. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, so with that, I have a motion and a second. Uh, let me just go around. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. 
And I'm a yes, so that passes unanimously. And with that, we will then go on to the UDO and uh, Laura or Allison. Allison, do you want to take away? I don't see it. Laura. Yeah, she's, she's here. I'll turn it over to her in just a minute. Um, okay. So as you're aware, the, um, the draft, the first draft of the UDO was issued on October 7th. And since then, we've spent some time really talking with um, many folks in the community. And I think in the beginning, really focusing on what's in the document, um, clarifying some misinterpretations and just helping people understand it a little bit better. And that's understandable. It is a dense 608 page document. It's although it's more organized than what we have to work with today, it still is new. Um, and we're just really starting to get an understanding of the issues that we really need to be talking to council and the community about. And Laura will go over those um, in her presentation. And so right now the UDO is ex expected to be before council for adoption in July. And what we'd like to do is consider some internal changes to the schedule just to allow additional time here on the front end to talk with the community about some of the things that we're hearing, just needing a little bit of additional time. So. Originally, it planned to close the comment window on January 14th, uh, but we would like to extend that through February and March, and we're still working through the details of that, and then we'd bring that before council in January. But this would allow us to continue these important conversations. It would allow the community to be able to see the second draft of the policy map alongside the draft UDO, and then it would also allow us to digest and have more conversations about the economic impact analysis work that Matt will talk about a little bit later. Uh, the second stakeholder meeting is scheduled for mid to sort of the third week in January, and it would allow us to not only incorporate those findings, but really talk through what changes we might want to make um, as a result of those findings. So um, with that, I will turn it over to Laura uh, to talk through just the engagement uh, that we've done thus far on the UDO, what, what we're starting to hear, and then over to Matt for uh, an update on the economic impact analysis work. Thank you, Allison. We could go. Can I, can I ask a quick question of yeah. Allison before we move on to you, Laura? Certainly. Um, yeah, you had said that it's scheduled for adoption in July. The schedule we just adopted said we don't have a, meet a TAP meeting in July. But are you are you indicating that we're, you're going to move the adoption schedule? No, no, keeping the adoption schedule the same. So uh, with a July adoption date, so we may need to talk through that. Um, that's what we has been before council before, and we we aren't proposing to make any changes to that. It's really just our own internal um, conversations with the community, and when we're closing a comment window, and just recognizing that that comment window needs to be extended a little bit. Okay, but I think the July thing is the one that I'm concerned about because the document we just approved it said no meeting in July because it's the council break. Um, so if it's the council break, I don't know if you're still, if you have that in mind that you're gonna find the time before council goes on break to adopt it. And secondly, um, we'll, we gotta think about the election too because we don't know when we know the primary is in May. Presumably, the uh, general will be in June. Does that mean we have a new council that will be adopting the UDO? The, the tentative general election would be sometime in July, but it hadn't been determined yet. So I think anything we're adopting that involves a timeline is probably going to be contingent on those things becoming final, which is probably mid to late January before we would know. Okay, it's just something to keep in mind. I, I can't imagine anybody wants to see a brand new council having to vote on this. So, um, Mr. Nicholson, are you assuming that there will be a runoff in the primary in the other races? And otherwise, the normal thing, if there wasn't, would be for us to have our general a month after. That was yep. going to be the time to, to the timeline before, and you would uh, you would then seat council in the following month that's that's not the interpretation of the old schedule right that's not the interpretation of somebody who's in, who knows a lot more about north carolina elections than i do but i don't i think that's a topic we could debate another time but i, I just mean to say it's all going to be contingent on an election schedule that we don't yet know it's just something to keep in mind that's all um uh, may I approach him? um 
I have a question or uh, comment about uh, 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 Ms. Craig's uh, su uh, suggestions. It's actually, actually a suggestion. Um, I, I, I still haven't heard anything about um, council engagement, um, understanding um, the, you know what happened with the Comp 2040 plan, and honestly, um, kind of um, comparing this to another very dense ordinance that we uh, um, um, haggle and and vote over in the budget um, every year. I think it would be prudent uh, to have full council kind of work sessions um, uh, 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 around uh, the UDO, where all we do is kind of talk about the UDO um, and to give opportunities uh, for for us, because we're all engaging ourselves um, with the same people that you are engaging with. We're having conversations, and I still don't see um, uh, the, the, the place where all 12 of us um, can kind of come together and iteratively um, go through this, understand it, compare it to those um, um, of the information that we're getting over time. So um, I would suggest that we look at something like we do around the budget, uh, where we, we are having full council work sessions and ultimately um, give some type of arena uh, for, for us to uh, give specific changes or struggles or whatever it may be um, as, as we go through this. Just my suggestion. Thank you. And, and we heard um, when we were at full council um, the other week that you wanted a different type of engagement. And so we're working with corporate communications now on coming up with different ways in which we can make sure that you're getting the information that you want in the in the type of manner that you are, are looking for. So we'll be back to council in January with some of those ideas. Okay, thank you. Um, so go, go ahead with your presentation. Thank you, next slide please. Um, just a reminder, we presented this to council last Monday to full council, but we are in the midst of the virtual conversations for the UDO. We have one more tomorrow, that's the last one this year, and then four planned for next year. Certainly if we extend the comment period, we'll be looking at um, more engagement opportunities. Um, these do focus on specific topics and are scheduled for one hour. We actually, for each topic, we have two meetings, one at noon on the day specified and one from six to seven. And we're really getting a lot of participation, um, somewhat surprisingly to us, at the noon meeting is where we're seeing more participation. Um, people do have to register to participate and that helps us all to um, be prepared for the meetings and track who's participating. So next slide. So how are we getting feedback? Obviously through the meetings that we're having, the open house and virtual meetings, but we're requesting that if people have specific comments as opposed to kind of wanting to talk through an issue and understanding the ordinance, that they put comments into the online portal that is on our website. So far we say we have 100 plus comments, but many of those comments have multiple comments under them. So we're into the hundreds of comments so far and are expecting more. Uh, as we move forward. Um, we've also been having meetings as requested um, with groups like um, folks from the real estate industry, sustainability interests, um, and we'll be continuing to do that. And um, we're also getting some, not a lot, um, but direct communication from the community through um, emails, etc. And we're also set up to take comments through 311. Next slide. So we talked about this last week a little bit. What are we hearing so far? We get feedback and questions unrelated to the UDO. It's understandably folks don't always understand what's in and what's out, or just have comments or, or questions about how some related city services work. Um, we are getting some comments that need clarification or where we recognize that there's some misreading or misinterpretation and maybe we need to make changes to the draft to clarify in some cases and, and in others, maybe there just was a, a misreading. And then finally, the most important thing is we're getting recommend, recommendations for areas that need adjustment um, and revision to the draft UDO. And if we go to the next slide, I wanna talk a little bit more about those. So we got the question, um, from council, how are we responding to comments? Um, 
how are people knowing that the comments are not just going into um, the portal and will there be feedback from staff? So we are compiling the comments and developing responses for each comment. We will be um, posting the comments that we have to date online um, before the end of the year and hopefully before the end of this week. Um, and we're also developing responses for each comment. And we'll probably put the responses out there um, in a rolling matter indicating that we have resolution on certain items, we might be recommending a change or not recommending a change and providing a reason why. Um, and then we'll, or other comments, we'll still be working on and letting folks know that, that um, we are still, those are still under study. Um, and also we're having conversations related to some of the major comments that um, we are receiving from folks that are submitting and um, working to resolve these comments. And some of the, the topics that we've already met on or that we are going to be meeting on are um, feedback on short-term rentals, general zoning standards, zoning for uptown, we'll be meeting with um, center city partners um, and some of their constituents, Transporta transportation standards, including um, the comprehensive transportation review, industrial block links, tree standards, um, including particularly the heritage tree standards, stormwater regulations, uh, adaptive reuse. And this is just a short list of what we anticipate and one reason where we would like to extend the comment period so we also have a chance to continue to have these conversations. Um, the next slide, I'm going to hand this off to Matt um, to talk a bit about the economic impact analysis work he's doing. Yes, thanks, Laura. Um, so we are in the middle of a process of doing an economic analysis to support the UDO. Um, what we're doing is trying to evaluate would be the impacts on development feasibility from the UDO, major UDO changes that have been identified, and then trying to translate those into potential larger sort of impacts on the greater economy if there are some. Um, and really, this has been a process that has involved the development community, community uh, directly. So we did a kickoff meeting in um, November with a, a large group of designers, developers, and other practitioners that are use the that will use the UDO um, on a regular basis. Um, and then we had two weeks ago a series of focus group meetings um, organized by different sort of product types or sort of context types. And so what we're doing is really a three-step process of identifying major development cha or major changes to the regulations uh, in the draft UDO, analyzing those impacts on development feasibility, and then highlighting the major changes, the costs and benefits related to those changes, and any potential recommendations for changes that were identified by these groups. Um, we have, um, we go to the next slide. Um, in our first discussion, we started to uh, hear some feedback from the development community about the need to really evaluate real sites and projects and also sort of prototype sites and trying to translate the difference between existing processes and regulations and the new UDO will be difficult, but we'll need to use real sites to try to identify that. We need to make sure that we're doing a diverse sampling of different projects throughout the city, understanding what potential impacts on competitiveness with other cities are, um, and looking at a, a diversity of uses um, and also sort of different types of housing or office or retail, whether that's you know for rent or for sale housing products, and others, and then a desire to really also look at the impacts of the UDO on small businesses or adaptive reuse of existing buildings, um, whereas a lot of the other analysis is sort of focused on new projects or new buildings. Um, so next slide. So uh, to support EPS on this, uh, the city has retained Perkins and Will, um, who will be doing a really robust design-based analysis on the impacts of the UDO. Um, and really testing what the different uh, impacts on potential yield and building form, 
that will be impacted by the changes in the EDO. And so, you know, making sure that they assess, uh, you know, what the impacts on key indicators such as curb locations, the impacts of tree save areas, height restrictions, those sort of things to help visually represent what some of those changes are in the EDO. So it's easier for you all and the community at large to kind of understand what the impacts on development are, as well as those practitioners that we're working with hand in hand um, helping them uh, help us test the UDO in a way to identify any changes that are needed. Uh, next slide. Um, so I mentioned we had those, uh, we've started doing some focus group meetings that we had to kick off in November. We had round one in, in uh, two weeks ago on the 9th and 10th. Um, pretty robust uh, participation over, I think around 30 or 40 professionals in all the different groups, uh, you know, spent an hour and a half or two hours with us, sometimes more, um, working through some of the initial issues. Um, and like I mentioned, we've grouped those folks into diff six different development types. So there's a group looking at neighborhood one, so more sort of uh, single family and duplex type development, a centers and neighborhood two group, a uh, commercial development group, a manufacturing and logistics group, an affordable housing specific group, which is a little bit different of an angle uh, that we're looking at. And then I mentioned that addition of an adaptive reuse or sort of redevelopment of existing building group. And so- um, hey, Matt, Matt, can I ask? Yep, a sure. Um, that analysis being done by Perkins and Will, um, it's being done for each place type, but is it also going to analyze the dynamic that occurs when one place type is put next to another place type? So an example that um, one of our former planning commissioners brought up was the campus place type next to single family housing. So that would be on Moorhead. Um, and the, and I can't remember the specifics, but he was pointing out that the, the requirements of a campus um, wouldn't necessarily work well next to single family to N1. So, you know, is, is that site design and analysis taking into account how, how two place types together relate to each other? Yeah, so that's, that's an interesting question. Um... I don't think we've specifically talked about that, but I, I think and I suspect that they're able to do that. Um, so what Perkins and Will is doing is looking at the current uh, regulations, the current zoning, and sort of identifying um, the range of different development forms that can occur in that. Um, we, you know, not, this is not the best terminology, but what's sort of the worst and best outcomes um, and also considering that there's a fair amount of conditional rezoning that goes on now. Um, and then kind of doing the same analysis for the new UDO and the new zone districts and identifying, you know, what are, what are different outcomes that could, you know, different building forms, different project designs that could come out of uh, the UDO, the draft UDO. And I think there's a way to try to illustrate what some of those adjacencies may look like in terms of what the design of uh, uh, an N1 uh, parcel would look like versus one that's in that campus designation. And so um, I'll have to relay that feedback to Perkins and Will and see um, what their thoughts are. But my, I suspect there's a way that we can try to illustrate some of those, those concerns. And I think that's getting back to what Mr. Winston said, and I really like that suggestion. Somehow that's where we have to be able to have opportunities to meet the small groups or whatever to have to really get down to the nitty gritty of those things. You know, another example would be um, a, a place type that does allow for height and density backing up to single family. And the question being, should there be more of a transition when it's backing up to a certain to a certain place type. So you don't have to have it with these place types. You do have to have the transition with those place types. That Those are the kinds of questions that I, uh, yeah. That's, I hope. Yeah, we, we can look into that. Um, yeah. Madam Chair, could I ask a couple quickly? 
Sure. Uh, for one, uh, Allison, is there some sort of a schedule of meetings for with uh, the representatives of the development industry? Uh, I know we've had conversations and they've participated, but uh, I had talked to the manager about trying to have a, uh, a more formal kind of negotiation to try to get these guys on board. Is there something like that taking shape? We've been having informal meetings uh, on various topics and so and meeting with individuals from the development community that have questions or are raising concerns about specific topics. There hasn't been um, any formality about it outside of the economic impact analysis. Um, we've been meeting with them like others that have requested meetings open to any suggestions council may have but thus far I think we mutually find those meetings to be beneficial and then ask as a result of those meetings that they put comments um, in the UDO portal so that we can make sure that those are being captured and responded to so that everyone can see those. So as you know, they do have a working group. It actually meets pretty regularly. We've had a letter from them uh, enumerating some concerns. And I will just keep repeating, as I've said so often before, uh, I feel these guys are partners. They're a source of expertise and capital, and we can't treat them, you know, ask them to stand in line to submit their comments. I would hope that we would have high-level conversations. One thing they noted, for example, it wasn't on the list I just saw of issues, was this overlap question about the true save, tree save in the open space, and that has the potential to drive the cost of housing up. And Matt, I was going to say to you, competitiveness is really, for the most part, about what does it cost to do development and uh, what, what, is, what are the compliance hurdles? Like what is the time it takes to get the necessary approvals and, and to kind of do business? And so uh, I, I hope that as you do the economic impact analysis, we will see these comparisons about cost for similar development, uh, implementation time, and then think about how sensitive uh, investment decisions are between Nashville and Charlotte um, and to those things and, and therefore try to interpret the impact on investor appetite for Charlotte uh, based on the conclusions that you reach. The, uh, uh, on the affordability thing, the other economic uh, impact is if we do more about public transportation and we succeed in bringing the cost of housing down, that could draw in more people, more job seekers. It could help us on the labor front. It could also create employment opportunities for people that they might not have perceived before. So that's another economic impact dimension. Uh, and I, I just hope we'll get some insight into those things uh, as a result of the work you're talking about. I can't tell from what you've said so far. Yes, um, uh, I, I, a couple things. Um, uh, we are working, you know, these are pretty um, intimate conversations with uh, the development community that we've been having in these focus groups. Um, so, you know, um, getting really into the details um, and we'll be doing some iterating um, virtually, but also coming back, as I mentioned in mid January to do another round of sort of in-person meetings with those folks. Um, and really collectively, the goal is to identify what they, they and we think the changes are um, that are most impactful. And then from there, trying to really measure those those uh, larger economic impacts that you've mentioned um, uh, as a result of that, uh, of what we're finding. And so both looking at, we've heard from the development community, both the conversation about just pure cost and you know yield out of the development site, and as well as the process impacts and the timing impacts. Um, and trying our best to try to, you know, as we can quanti quantify those in, in other places, fall, you know, provide qualitative um, insight as well. Um, and so, yeah, there should, there will be additional insight into those items. And so thank you for those comments. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Go, go ahead. Uh, so this is the, the last slide for sort of the economic, um, analysis that's going on and then i think there's one more slide around um the transition from the current ordinances to the udo and i think laura are you going to take this back over yes i am matt are you finished i am okay. yes okay um the one thing we also wanted to acknowledge that we've heard and are working on 
is how we would transition from the current ordinances to the UDO. Um, we know that this can be a challenge and we understand from people telling us this can be a challenge for development projects um, that are already in process. So um, the UDO does have allowances related to vesting and permit choice that's established by state law. Staff is also looking at additional considerations, including the adoption versus the effective date, how this would work um, with conditional petitions submitted prior to um, UDO adoption, projects that have initial permits uh, approved prior to UDO adoption, but then may have um, further approvals and permits after UDO adoption, um, and the impacts of zoning translation through the UDO. So um, we put that out there to say we're looking at that. Our intent is not to create unnecessary burdens for property owners and staff, but wanted you all to be aware that that's another topic that we are working on and discussing with others. And I think that ends our presentation. Wow. Okay. Um, that gives us lots of times for questions. If anyone else on the committee has questions. Could I just ask one more quickly, Madam Chair? Sure. Uh, yep. This issue about uh, the kind of bureaucracy and so on, uh, are, are we able to assess how much more work people will have to do or how much more information they will have to submit, what their costs would be just to uh, get approvals for certain kinds of development and, and get the inspections done, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, do we know how it will play out in practice for somebody who wants to build? Um, I, I don't want to speak for Matt, but that would come into the costing of development. Um, we can certainly provide council an update on that as um, we look through this. And we're also getting some feedback on some of the the um, maybe additional or revised permits like the drainage permit and I know stormwater is working on um, really trying to right size that permit and making sure that it, it's needed um, when they ask for it and we're not overdoing it. So um, we can work on some of that and also can work with Matt and um, David Green on the work they're doing as far as that goes. Certainly understand that perspective and don't want to elongate time frame and unnecessarily increase costs. As you know, we spent a couple of years trying to address uh, issues raised by developers about how hard it was to get stuff done in Charlotte. Uh, and I think we actually made some progress with the county on that. Uh, so wouldn't want to see us backslide in that area as a result of all of this. Thanks, Allison. Thanks, Mr. Driggs. Um, I have my hand up. Uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, I just want to reiterate that, like, again, um, the importance of finding uh, a way uh, that a full council can discuss, not, not stand. Mr. Winston, I don't know about folks online, but those of us in the room cannot hear you. Um, public feedback. But to dive into this document, um, we've met as a full council. So, um, hey, Braxton, speak up. They about, can't hear you in the room. I think it's it's more of a connection issue than a volume um, issue. November, Apparently, you can't hear us at all. December, we're it here um, in both having Mr. Winston, it's just a connection issue. You're, we're hearing about every other syllable. I think what he's saying, though, is that, you know, having Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's better. Yeah, so uh, what I was saying, we've, we've talked about uh, this in full council in, in November, December, and we've talked about this in committee a couple of times. But in none of those meetings have we been able to dive into the actual document. Um, um, in the November meeting, again, I've, 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 I've asked several questions and made comments about the actual document. 
Um, but again, we haven't been, I don't want those to, to be just for myself, right? I don't want us to be able to talk about this as, as a council. Um, and if we're not able to do that, I'm not really sure. Um, you know, I don't want to put staff's hard work and the community's hard work um, to, to have it be for not to get caught up in jumbled conversations uh, way down the line. Um, uh, we have to get into, we have to just get into the, 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 the specifics of the document. Um, and I don't really see um, um, where, where, where the plans are to do that. And, and I hope uh, we get there quickly. I agree with Mr. Winston on that. I think that's what Mr. Driggs is saying too. What I'd like to ask of staff is if we can schedule some technical sessions where um, we can have a few council members come at the same time and possibly even someone, again, someone from planning commission or a developer, somebody that has the, that ha raises those technical issues we need to be able to hear it. We need to also be able to ask our own questions on the nitty gritty, you know, in the weeds of the document itself. So I wonder if you guys could organize that for us. Um, I like doing it with other council members because you all raise questions I might not have thought of. And I just think we learn a lot more from that um, and possibly, you know, do it virtually or in person. So. Um, I'm not sure when in the process there is room for that, but I do think that would be important. One, Mayor Pro Tem, one point on that that I, I'd add in, I agree wholeheartedly, um, but I also think we need to hold ourselves accountable as council members when those things take place that we actually take advantage of them because it was, what, a week or two ago that we had the opportunity to do something similar to what we're talking about right now with the policy map, and I think half of council, maybe not even half of council, was in attendance and so obviously yeah. we, we all have things that come up but um, that was pretty well organized and prepared for by staff and then very few council members were there so if well we the big part about that there was we found out at the, at the last minute when we were trying to log into the meeting that there was no virtual option so uh, if we if we're it's still in the middle of a pandemic if there's not a viable virtual option i don't know if that is a very well prepared um, presentation um, so we've got we we we've, we've got to figure. So I I will I will speak for myself. Uh, I was very I was hitting staff up like where's the link where's the link and we we're told that there's no link. So it was a public meeting um, that when you're looking at it on YouTube, it was just seemed like a bunch of people in a room walking around. Um, it wasn't um, really uh, an effective um, session. So um, we've got to do something better and different for the for the times that we're in. And, and I would agree with that. The industry guys uh, should understand that they are ultimately negotiating with us. So we're advised by the staff and the staff is doing a lot of this work. Uh, but in the final analysis on some pretty basic policy questions, they really need to have the opportunity to make their case to us. And so I think those small group meetings would be helpful to us and them and could lead us to a better result. Thanks. And I do, I think the way that we do that, it could work virtually where, you know, in, in the one to Mr. Eggleston's point, in that one, it was, a, the room was set up such that we were in sort of different stations or with different people. That would have been really hard to assign. No, uh, there, there is plenty of technology out there that you can do virtual convention style meeting for that. There's a product called Jumbo out there. there there's um, ways to, to do Zoom breakout rooms. There's a ton of technology, so that's an excuse. Is, 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 that's not a viable excuse at this point in time. There are a ton well, I guess of I'm, what I'm saying is it was what it was. And for those of us that were there in person, it was incredibly helpful, which is why I'd say we need more of that. But you're right. We can certainly do it in a way that basically here are your four sessions, sign up for one of them. Um, and then, you know, you're sitting at a table and there's an option to have you know, we can do it in the large conference room, whatever, and you can have somebody on the screen there. There's no reason we couldn't be able to do that and, and ask questions without having to have, you know, a, a whole room set up like that. So um, I do hope we can do that. I found that incredibly helpful. We were able to really get down to, to brass tacks on specific issues, um, and, and we need to flush those out before it comes before the full council. Um, any other questions? 
If not, thank you to staff. I just want to say thank you, staff, for building enough time into this meeting today. We had two hours allotted and we were able to get through everything, which is great. Um, because this is, I think, really the most important work we're doing right now. And I appreciate that you all build, um, you know, better to have a longer uh, block of time for our meetings than to run over and not be able to get all of our questions answered. So thank you all for that. Uh, and with that, if we don't have any other questions, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. So staff, I just wanted to say, uh, appreciate all your good work. Uh, I, I tend to be uh, asked a lot of questions, put it that way, but I, I, I really respect what you're doing. Uh, and I, I would encourage you to take at least an afternoon off over the holidays uh, and look forward to seeing you in the new year. Have a great holiday. Likewise, thank you everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Have a motion to adjourn? I'll move. I'll move. All right, all in Second. favor, turn off your cameras. Thanks everyone. Bye.